All right. Hello, Chicago. Thank you for uh, bearing with us with our um, technological uh, limitations here in this glorious future. I, I blame it all on global warming if it weren't, or at least uh, mesoscale convection. If it weren't for all that, then our speakers would all be here in the room. But um, I assure you, I am not an avatar. I am. I was going to say I'm not an android. I guess that's not completely true. I'm wearing glasses and I'm on medication. So like you, I'm te slightly technologically enhanced, but nonetheless, I'm here in the flesh. My name is David Grinspoon. I'm an astrobiologist. And uh, I'm going to talk with you for the next 20 minutes or so about the feedback between science fiction and astrobiology. I started out probably, as did a lot of you, as a youthful science fiction geek. Uh, I couldn't get enough of the stuff when I was a kid. During my, you know, my earliest memories, of course, are of, uh, of Apollo, and during the late 60s, that futuristic world meshed with the world of 2001 and other smart science fiction to the point where, as a kid, I'm not sure I even completely drew the line. It was all what was happening and where we were going, and it was the future, and it was exciting. And my first sort of literary crush, my first love, uh, were, were these um, Isaac Asimov stories, the Lucky Star stories, which are sort of, I guess, what you would now call young adult fiction, um, although I don't think the term was in use then. But they're, you know, sort of adolescent science fiction, but very smart. And they all took place in the real solar system on planets that were defined by what science really knew about them and informed speculation within the boundaries of that real science. But the interesting thing is those books were written in the 40s, in the 50, actually in the 50s. And by the time I read them in the early 70s, it, the, you know, the science was all out of date. But what was really cool, and one of the first times I, I think, became aware of this feedback between science and science fiction was when I read these stories, they had been reissued in the early 70s. And they had these introductions by Isaac Asimov that said, look, I want to reissue these stories. They're fun. But when I wrote them, this is what we knew about the planets. And here's what we know now. And they had a little introduction where he said all, everything that was wrong about it. And then you could go and enjoy the swashbuckling story of Lucky Star and his sidekick, Big Man, and they're out in the solar system battling the forces of, of evil and making sure that, um, that, that solar system society is, is safe and enlightened. And so you got the story, but you also got this lesson not only in the science, but in the history of science and the fact that we were exploring the planets now, now being the early 70s, and learning things. And so, so I, I felt like I learned a lot from these books, probably more than I would have without that sort of um, disconnect between the science of when they were written and when I was reading them. The one example of this, and a one that sort of became important um, or, or relevant to the direction that my science took later in life is this story, Lucky Star in the Oceans of Venus, which was written with this conception of Venus that was believed to be scientifically accurate right up to the beginning of the space age, which was that Venus was relatively Earth-like, maybe a little bit warmer, a little bit wetter, was sort of like a tropical carboniferous Earth type place that probably had life. Why not? It's got clouds. Clouds are wet. It's a little bit closer to the sun, so it's warm. But it was believed by scientists to be a pretty Earth-like place. And in fact, here's a, a little piece of something that was written in the New York Times in 1928, um, quoting um, the brilliant Cambridge physicist um, Arthur Eddington talking about how um, Venus probably has life because it's got all the right conditions. And that was the, uh, the known Venus in the 50s when Asimov wrote this book. But then our very first spacecraft that we successfully sent to another planet was Mariner 2 in December 1962. And the one 
scientific instrument it had on it was uh, um, this thing that's pointing up from the spacecraft to the left there, which is a microwave radiometer. And the first ever result of planetary exploration was the, what was returned from that radiometer, which told us that Venus is, in fact, very, very hot and not at all Earth-like and not that fantasy Venus poof just vanished in that moment when those results were returned. And here's the editorial about it in the New York Times uh, the following February, and where Venus says no. And at the v very end, you can read about how um, Mars now remains our only hope of turning this universal dream into reality. And the evidence so far is not very encouraging. The message from Venus may mark the beginning of the end of mankind's grand romantic dreams. So maybe in that, at that moment, planetary exploration seemed like a little bit of a bummer um, because there go our grand romantic dreams. But in fact, uh, we, you know, we've kept going and we've uh, found a lot of magnificent things about the solar system. But um, you know, this was all just kind of fascinating to learn about and to watch unfold when I was a kid. And I, um, with some friends of mine, uh, joined this group called the L5 Society, and we had this kind of techno-utopian sense of the future and space, and that was where things were going, and 2001 was gonna be like that. And of course, it didn't work out that way, but I mean, one thing we learn is that, is that our extrapolations of the future are always linear, short, linear extrapolations of what's happening now. And it's not always the case that, that um, we imagine things will be more advanced than they will. Sometimes it goes the other direction. If you read science fiction from the 50s, they talk about man first getting to the moon in 1996 or 2007 because nobody foresaw the big push of Apollo that was very nonlinear and accelerated things. And then, of course, you read science fiction from the Apollo era when I was a kid, and it's the opposite. Things were on the steep curve, and everybody imagined that extrapolating and were, you know, very optimistic about where we would be now. So. It can go awry in either direction, but I think we just sort of cognitively can't help making these sort of linear extrapolations of the pace of change and assuming we know what the future is going to be life, like. And usually we don't. Uh, sometimes we get lucky. Uh, so this feedback between science and science fiction, and in particular astrobiology, um, goes back a long way and, and in some ways um, began with, uh, of course, the observations and interpretations of Percival Lowell of the famous canals on Mars. And Lowell was uh, a very charismatic writer and lecturer and very committed to certain ideas. And he claimed to have observed these canals on Mars. And he, such was the power of, of his persuasion that other people saw them too and mapped them out. And for a while, the world went along with this idea that, yeah, there were canals on Mars, and they were the signs of a dying civilization and this whole sort of cosmogony. Uh, now, Lowell, of course, gets a bad rap um, because this is the most famous thing about him. It turns out that he actually had some really interesting ideas and in some ways was the, the father of modern comparative planetology and that if you look at his ideas embedded in, in the ideas of the time, they're not quite as ridiculous as they seem to us now. But uh, nonetheless, of course, the canals on Mars, once we actually imaged the surface of Mars, were not there. But this was the source of a lot of science fiction. Of course, H.G. Wells of War of the Worlds fame was very influenced by Lowell. He had read Lowell and bought into his vision. And, and Wells was also really interested. He was a, a, influenced by, he was a student of uh, T.H. Huxley, Thomas Henry Huxley who um, was known as Darwin's bulldog, and therefore Wells had a very direct um, connection, lineage to Charles Darwin, and Wells saw the sort of evolutionary perspective on things as applying not just on Earth, but throughout the solar system. So his fiction was very much embedded in, in the science of the time, both the science of, that we now know was sort of a dead end of Percival Lowell, but also Darwin, and uh, it's, it's actually, if you read uh, War of the Worlds, it's a very intelligent, um, thought-provoking book. And, uh, but of course, it gave us the menace from space, a trope that you know, has never gone away. And the interesting thing, is, of course, is that now, when we look at Mars, there are dried up channels everywhere, all over the planet. It's just that they're not 
linear relics of a civilization. They're um, curvilinear and um, fractal relics of a time on Mars when things were warmer and wetter naturally. And in some ways, I think in the popular and even the scientific imagination, the canals of Lowell sort of morphed into the channels on Mars that we see now. And the wishful thinking, the wanting there to be life on Mars and that affecting our science, which arguably started with Lowell, still goes on. And we're still, you know, in the 60s, we, people observed the chlorophyll on Mars, and then it turned out it was something else. And then recently, there was methane observed that was coming from microbes, and then, well, maybe now the methane's gone. And it seems like we, we really want there to be life on Mars to the point where um, even, you know, really good scientists, uh, maybe we fool ourselves sometimes. Uh, I don't think there's life on Mars, but um, we can talk about that um, later on if you want. But I'm going to move on. Um, here's a scientist you uh, probably heard of. Carl Sagan was actually um, a, an important mentor of mine and a, a friend of mine. And he was a big fan of science fiction and really influenced by science fiction in his work. He was very um, disdainful of bad science fiction. In fact, Carl hated Star Trek. He was really harsh about Star Trek, and we got into some fights about Star Trek, and I actually convinced him to sit down and watch a couple of really good episodes, and he graciously admitted that, yeah, it was pretty good. So I worked on him a little bit with Star Trek, but, you know, he, the, and, and there's some valid criticisms I'll, I'll come to of Star Trek, but, but one of his, Carl's favorite stories, in fact, he sent me a copy of this story. He was always trying to steer me towards good science fiction and away from what he considered bad. He, and when I was a student, he sent me a copy of the story, Micro, Microcosmic God by Theodore Sturgeon. And this, it's, it's a really cool story, and it involves a scientist in his lab, figuring out how to create life, create these little organisms in his lab, and then figuring out how to speed up their evolution and get them to go ma through many, many generations and many, many evolutionary developments in a short period of time. And then, of course, because it's fiction and you know needs drama, of course, something goes wrong. They get really super advanced to the point where they get more advanced than, than we are and develop technology and then decide that they want to uh, change the program themselves. But I won't. I won't tell you how it ends in case you want to go read it, but it's, it's a great story. But um, what's interesting is that when you think about Carl Science himself, here he is in his planetary simulation lab in Cornell, where I actually worked a couple of summers. And he was trying to, um, not really trying to create life in the lab, but doing experiments that were uh, creating some of the building blocks of life and helping us understand some of the chemical pathways that might have led to the origin of life here on Earth and other places like Titan. So there's some, um, some interesting resonance there with his science and some of the, the fiction that he liked. Now, famously, um, Carl later in life also decided to uh, write some science fiction himself. And here's, um, here's uh, his contact um, where he explored some, some interesting themes that had been important in his, his nonfiction work. Um, throughout his career about alien contact and what it means for us and, the, you know, even the, the spiritual implications and so forth. And I can't help but read this enticing inscription that says, For David, who inspired pages 16 to 18, with fond good wishes from Annie and me, Carl. So you can also ask me about that later if you want. But <laughs> what's on page 16 to 18? All right. Anyways, so I think um, if we're thinking of the commonalities as... Um, as Lawrence already said, um, you know, it's not really the same coming up with a good story as coming up with science, and that the, the, a good story isn't necessarily based only on good science. But I think it's true that a good story, the good science, like a good story, often does start with a question of what if. And one thing that science fiction has done for us, those in my field, where we have to balance a kind of conservatism about what we might find out there with life in the universe with a real openness to, to possibility and not trying to think in too narrow-minded a way is a kind of careful, skeptical openness to outrageous ideas because sometimes an outrageous idea turns out to be true. Like the outrageous idea depicted here on this slide that uh, before the 1980s, there was this big mystery of what happened to the dinosaurs and 90% of other 
uh, life, um, kinds of life that um, suddenly got wiped out 65 million years ago. And it was a very outrageous idea that, um, that, the, uh, that it could have been an impact on Earth. As far, first um, proposed, as far as I know, by, um, by Harold Urey, or actually, I think, um, well, I'm not sure. So a couple people had proposed it in the, in the 40s or 50s. But then, of course, the, it was seriously proposed with good evidence in the 1980s. And it turned out to be true, this outrageous idea. That, and then this turned out to just be the beginning of this realization that intruders from the rest of the solar system have been very important um, factors in the evolution of the physical and biological history of Earth. And so sometimes uh, a f seemingly fringy idea turns out to be true. And this idea came along actually right when I was starting grad school and um, captured my imagination. I ended up doing my PhD thesis on what, you know, when good things happen, when bad things happen to good planets, catastrophic change on planets brought, up, brought about by large impact events. And the, and the notion of um, the, the, the subject of catastrophic climate change and catastrophic environmental change on Earth-like planets has been a mainstay of, of uh, my research career ever since. Um, so what I do now for my uh, sort of bread and butter main science, I'm, I do comparative planetology and astrobiology. So I do models of evolution, of um, surface atmosphere evolution, climate evolution of um, Earth and Venus and Mars and a little bit of Titan and a little bit of exoplanets, but basically putting together models where I'm looking at the interactions between the different components of the planets and trying to understand how they, um, how that, those complex interactions affect long-term evolution and in the service in particular of thinking about habitable environments and what, what allows a planet to establish habitability and what causes the planet to lose habitability. And obviously, these are loaded terms. Do we really know what habitability is? That's a really great question and one that's been explored a lot in science fiction. Um, I have also had the pleasure of being involved in some more speculative scientific projects. Um, and these days, with astrobiology being a funded field, you can get away with this. Uh, and so I've written papers. This is a, a paper I wrote with a colleague about um, the possibility of life on Titan, where we actually proposed a metabolic basis for Titan based on chemicals that are known to be there and doing some calculations of free energy and looking at the, the types of you know, microenvironments you could have on Titan. And so we, um, and actually, if you propose this kind of life on Titan, it even solves some problems, like what's up with the methane on Titan? It's a way of biogenically producing it making use of other things that are there, that we know are there, and releasing a lot of free energy. So this isn't claiming that we've discovered life on Titan or that we know there's life on Titan. It's a plausibility argument based on known chemistry and known physics and obs current observations of Titan. And that, you know, it's a testable hypothesis, so that's always nice. Um, and this is a, a paper that I wrote with some colleagues um, a few years ago on um, the, the possibility of life on Venus. You say life on Venus, that's ridiculous. But this is not on the surface of Venus, this is up in the clouds, which turn out to be a, a pretty benign environment. They're, they're basically room temperature and pressure. It's an aqueous environment. There's water, not very much of it, but there is some. Uh, there are plenty of energy sources. There are plenty of nutrients. And um, some of the obvious objections turn out to not be very good because now we know that they're is life on Earth in conditions more acidic than the Venus clouds, and we know that there's life in the upper atmosphere of Earth, and we know there's life that is very, very resistant to ultraviolet radiation, in fact, uses sulfur, which is in abundance on Venus, to act as an ultraviolet shield. So again, this is kind of a plausibility argument, not um, saying that, okay, so I believe there's life on Venus, but if, you know, part of what astrobiology does is explore the, the uh, parameter space of, um, of plausible life places, and this, these papers are offered in that spirit. But one thing that happened after I wrote some of these papers, and this is the fun part and why I'm bringing it up here, is that some science fiction authors took this and ran with it and, and um, used some of my work in their books. And so, for instance, um, Ben Bova wrote this story, Venus, 
and um, Sarah uh, Zeptel uh, wrote this uh, really neat book, I I, I, it's a novel I really like called The Quiet Invasion. And both of those involved some surprising ideas about life on Venus. Uh, and both of those authors acknowledged my work in their books. In fact, one of them um, is even, one of the books is even dedicated to me, which I thought was just lovely. So that was just fun, you know, being a kid that was so inspired by science fiction and got into this field and now finding that at least in some tiny way I'm influencing science fiction with my work. And, Oh, and this is a book I wrote called Venus Revealed, and um, this is an illustration that Carter Emmert did for um, that book. It's just, he did some sort of cartoons for me. We were trying to do it in kind of the style of George Gamow, where he just did these kind of cute little cartoons. And um, this is of a um, cloud-based research station on Venus. Um, and the, you know, sort of very end of the book, I get really speculative about will people ever go to Venus, and why the hell would you ever want to do that? And um, talk about possible, uh, you know, the ability to, um, to live and work on the clouds of Venus and why you might conceivably want to do that. And one reason why is, while I largely agree with what um, Lawrence said about um, why send people to these places when you can send machines, I think that's largely true. If we ever wanted to explore the surface of Venus in the kind of depth that we explore, say, the ocean surface on Earth, we use remotely operated vehicles from ships to do that and have people in the loop making those decisions of what to do next. If we wanted to do something like that on Venus, we couldn't do it from Earth because of the travel delay time of the light. So you might plausibly want to be in the atmosphere or orbit of Venus. Maybe that's stretching, but I have to try to come up with some reason. The real reason I think we'll ultimately go to Venus is because people are like cats. And we're just so curious that even beyond where it's good for us and we just do crazy shit because <laughs> we're curious human beings and that's what we do and so that's why I think at some point we probably will go to Venus. But anyways, moving along, um, one of the things astrobiologists have to deal with is all the sort of dumb alien images in society and the fact that this guy just won't go away. People really think that aliens look like this and it, you know, thank you Steven Spielberg. Uh, it's, you know, it's this very unimaginative, repeated meme of the alien with the, this pretty human with a big head and big eyes. And then, of course, Star Trek aliens all look pretty much human with funny forehead ridges or big ears or, or tattoos. Or, well, there's one in the upper right there that's actually a lizard person. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Gene Roddenberry. But in general, you know, they're just humans with makeup. And that's understandable from uh, a um, expediency point of view when you're making a TV show. But it's also, you know, that's, and that's why science fiction literature writing literature is often better than, than TV or movies because you can imagine anything you want. You don't have to try to necessarily visually create it. But, you know, it's, it's probably very unlikely that all these aliens would look so human. This does lead to some interesting questions about um, evolution and convergent evolution. And you can argue, for instance, for two eyes, because stereo vision is a good way to make sense of the world. And so maybe you know, evolution would favor two eyes. And you can go through this argument, bilateral symmetry, you know, all these things, and you can come up with some reasons why some of our qualities may be found elsewhere, but still, come on. Um, similarly, Star Trek planets are annoyingly unimaginative. The idea that you can just go into orbit and go, there's life, Jim, and oh, it's a class M planet, beam me down, and not just die, and in fact, sometimes eat the fruit you know, is, is really just silly. Although, you know, it's funny because I started, I, I, I write these columns for Sky and Telescope magazine, and I started writing one where I was really dissing Star Trek planets for that reason. And then I started thinking about, you know, okay, so with, um, you know, with Kepler now, the big reveal of our time, one of the big reveals of our time is that there are planets everywhere. And it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's the good news for modern man that, you know, Gene Roddenberry didn't live to see that his vision realized, but that part of his vision that there really are planets all over the galaxy, uh, lots of them, some of them even probably sort of Earth-like, is really true. And um, so probably the planetologists of the future, once we get a chance to really study these, there probably will be classes of planets, class M and class whatever, because there probably will be certain common evolutionary tracks. But the problem is, would there really ever be a planet where you could just beam down and breathe the air because it's so Earth-like? You know, probably not, but I started thinking about this, and there, there are certain non-arbitrary aspects of conditions here on Earth. Like, the, the oxygen level, it turns out, is just 
is sort of the maximum it can be without igniting spontaneous forest fires everywhere. So there's actually a physical reason why we have about 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. So when I thought about that, I thought, yeah, there probably is a class of, uh, I don't know how common they are, but there probably is a class of planets out there with oxygen that's about what it is here. Although I still um, would be skeptical that you could just go there and breathe the air, and I definitely would not try to eat the fruit. Um, okay, so, but, you know, what science fiction does for us as astrobiologists is help us to not be too narrow-minded. Um, there's a certain pragmatism in astrobiology. We're looking for life, we're looking in places very much like here. The, the conventional wisdom is that we basically, sh life should, we should have find a planet just like Earth. You know, and we convince ourselves life needs liquid water, it needs these certain conditions, it works so well here, and so the center of the habitable zone is just where we would be comfortable. Now maybe that's true, one can make some pretty good arguments for that sort of conservative um, viewpoint of life elsewhere, but it's also based on pragmatism. We are sort of looking under the street light for the keys, you know, we, that's where we're most likely, we know how to look for carbon-based life, we think, and water-based life. And it could be that there's some other kind of life that we're not just smart enough to imagine. As Lawrence said, nature's much more creative than we are. And so I'm sort of skeptical of the, the knowledge we have that life must be carbon-based and must be this certain way in water. It's a fine way to make life. I think it's worth looking for that kind of life. But I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere out there nature has cooked up a completely different way of doing it. And what's cool about science fiction is that even though we have this conservatism and this pragmatism that we're driven by out of necessity, out of trying to be good scientists and, and, and work from, uh, you know, fr from reasoned hypotheses, it's good to just really think widely, and science fiction has helped us out with that. If you read this, you know, the, the very vast science fiction literature about life elsewhere in the universe, a lot of ideas have been suggested, uh, interesting ideas, you know, could, could life be in, in an interstellar cloud? Could there be some kind of a life on a star operating on a different temporal and spatial scale than we could even easily be aware of? What about other kinds of intelligence? Could you have a swarm intelligence? Could you have an entire planet that was in some sense an uh, intelligent being. All of these ideas have been explored in science fiction and then when you think about SETI um, trying to detect other intelligences out there, there's the obvious let's listen for radio, we're doing that, we should do that, it's one, you know, it makes sense and there's a lot more of it to be done but then there's other ideas like looking for astroengineering, maybe advanced civilizations are building some kinds of structures, re designing their solar systems. You know, if you start to really consider what the exponential growth of technology, some of which we've been hearing about here today, could lead to given the possibility of survival not over just, you know, hundreds of years, which is what our technical civilization is, but thousands or tens of thousands or even longer time scales, it's hard to tell what the capabilities would be. So it's an interesting idea to look for astro astroengineering. And so this is another place where the ground has been tilled deeply by science fiction and scientists can kind of pick and choose from some of the ideas. And so there is a feedback that goes in both directions. Um, I'll end here with a quote from Ben Bova who says, the secret of good science fiction is that the author should be free to invent anything he or she can think of, providing no one can prove that it's wrong. No one can prove that intelligent creatures are not swimming in the planet-wide ocean of Jupiter. No one will be able to prove it until we send spacecraft into that vast unknown sea. Now, Ben Bova's talking about a certain kind of science fiction here, hard science fiction, um, that really explores within the limits of what is known and pushes. There's other kinds of good literature that are called science fiction, too, but this is, um, you know, in thinking about astrobiology, this has probably been the most sort of useful and, and where that fruitful feedback has um, has occurred, but it's true. Nobody can imp nobody can prove that until we send spacecraft there. So sometimes good science fiction almost acts as a dare. You know, disprove this. Well, okay, so we got to keep exploring and go send those spacecraft and find out what's there. And then in turn, what we learn, we are always learning surprising things. There's liquid water on Enceladus. There's geysers coming out of Europa. 
there's um, strange things happening on Titan we can't understand. So the more we learn, the more we um, provide fuel, provide um, raw material for the next generation of science fiction writers. Okay, so I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs>